Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Okay, as usual, you know, Beth has uh, said a few things that I'm going to say. And I can't believe that Anth, just in this last few minutes, even quoted the scripture I'm going to quote. So, and you know, we don't talk, I promise. We don't talk. That is absolutely the truth. So, um, something's uh, right. I really felt like to revisit something that I actually brought uh, back in, uh, I think it was May 2013. So it's as long ago as that, you know, over three years ago. And you think, wow. Um, and, uh, you know, I've only got half an hour or so, but I want to make sure that we just get to the point uh, tonight. Um, I'll tell you what, put that picture up first and I'll show you. This was my Valentine's card. Uh, not this February, but the February before. Anth had forgotten we were in India. And um, he decided that uh, he needed to make amends. So he took the, uh, the paper from the hotel and drew a picture for me. Now, any of you who have connected the two, do you remember the, when on that clip, uh, Greg wakes up and he's got the circle. Where was he? He was outside the circle. So we'd watched that film just before. And, of course, this is what he sent. And he put me in the middle. Now, it, he wrote Circle of Love, but I was in the middle. Isn't that lovely? Come on. Oh. It might be on a piece of Vivante by Taj notepaper, but the f feeling's there, isn't it? See, the thing is, when you looked at that clip a bit ago, what was the awful thing that kept going on that poor old Greg could never meet up to the expectations of this very demanding very fear-driven, very controlling father-in-law to be, and he kept finding himself outside the circle of trust. Have you been there, outside the circle of trust? Come on, be honest. Have you ever found yourself outside the circle of trust? It's horrible, isn't it? Really horrible. And... Um, most of the time, because of our human experience, we find ourselves there quite often. <laughs> I've been there so many times, I'm so used to it now. It's almost that I can smell it a long time before it happens. It's like, it's coming, it's coming. With some relationships, you know, and you think, oh, it's coming, I'm going to be put outside this circle. And it's not nice. And um, what I really want to get over to, to you tonight, uh, if I can, and do it well, is that we often uh, put on to God how we are with each other. So he has got this incredible circle of trust. It's made up of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and all the angelic hosts, and whatever that includes, because that's a quite interesting topic. We'll have to take one Wednesday night. But in this big circle, guess who is there? Me! Come on. Are you going to say you? Me! Well, how come? Surely I'm not good enough to be in that circle of trust. Yeah, you're right. But guess what? You are! Isn't that just amazing? I want you to say circle of the Godhead and point into the middle and say me. Come on. Now, Mr. F I, I hate using his name because it sounds very naughty, but it is his name. Mr. Fokker is never going to let Greg in the circle unless he lives up to his expectations. And we think that that's how God operates with us. Come on, be honest. This is what we do. Now, I really felt that I had to talk about offences tonight, revisit, because whether we like it or not, and I tried, I want to be practical in, in, in this church. I think that we have to equip each other, just like Anth did last week. 
Equipping us how to be humble. We have to equip ourselves how to deal with stuff that we, we d- we're facing every single day. Come on, let's have a, another bit of honesty. How many of you have faced issues that offended you this week? Yes. See? Do you want to know how to deal with it? Do you want to deal with it to the point that that circle that you and the person that you were getting all upset with, if you don't deal with it properly, guess where they're going to end up? Outside the circle of... Do you get it? Outside the circle of a trust. But if you know how to deal with it, they won't. Don't you want to know how to do this? You can take that off now. That was just... You'll remember that. You'll, you'll be asking, what, what did he get me in February, won't you? You might forget totally next time. So, Anyway, Matthew 18, and I'll try and go through this, this, this quickly, but um, because this happens to us all the time, I just think it's, it's good to try and figure out where does it come from. You see, in Matthew 18, Jesus says this word, these words. He says, woe to the world... Whoa, that's a word, isn't it? Whoa, whoa. And aren't we woed when we're in that situation of offence? Woe to the world because of offences. It is inevitable that they will come. So Jesus is very clear. You better get used to it. They're going to come, so you better know what to do about them. Is that fair enough? Now, what causes them? Let's just have a very practical lesson. And, and some of you might say, no, nah, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't right. But actually, it is very, very simple. Offences come when your identity, who you think you are, is challenged by someone else and they are saying, who you think you are, I don't think the same. That's it. Very, very simple. You'll say, well, oh, I've never... No, that's not how it feels when this is going on. But that is what's going on. So you get offended when the person who's speaking to you and doing whatever it is they're doing are actually challenging who you think you are. We could... Who do you think you are? Felt like Bob Nichols then. So, your identity is questioned. Can I give you some examples? Because I know sometimes you you click into it if I give you some examples. What about this? If you think you're intelligent and someone suggests you're stupid. I won't look because I'll I'll probably be able to tell by your face, won't I? How about this one? If you think you're a servant... And someone suggests that you're selfish. If you think you're a hundred percenter and someone suggests that you're a part-timer. If you think you're a great parent and someone suggests your kids are not all they should be. Do you like these? Is any hitting the mark? If you think you're a great employee and someone suggests you're not cutting it. If you think you're honest and someone suggests you're lying. If you think you're a great wife or a husband and your partner says goodbye and leaves. If you think you're faithful And someone suggests you're not. These are everyday stuff. Aren't they? Do they ring a bell? (laughs) Somebody's laughing. Yeah. This is where the rubber hits the road. And Jesus said, these offences are going to come. Now, I could say it's because Jesus knew that all of us were going to struggle with our identity. Why were we going to struggle with our identity? Because we'd shifted from a place where our identity came from the Godhead. We decided we were going to figure out our own, make ourselves. And we've talked about how we create our own identity by all sorts of disguises. But this is where 
the rubber hits the road. Now you can imagine if some of those illustrations that I give you, imagine if all of them are happening at the same time. <laughs> oh, volcano waiting to erupt. How many have had a couple of them going on at the same time? And you know what's really interesting? I have found that over my later years, I've got much more compassionate about people who are upset and getting them knickers in a twist. Can I use that phrase? Because now I realise that there's more to the story than we ever really know. You see, when you're dealing with somebody, you're dealing with just one aspect of their lives. And yet there's all sorts of other dynamics going on. And when you meet them on a particular day, you just get that one little bit. So James, I'm with you. We've got Com Life. We sat, isn't this nice? But there's all bunch of stuff going on. And then I suddenly say something that just touches that point. Do you get me? Isn't that what happens? No, I don't happen to none of you. You're all right, so... What's really interesting as well, have you ever thought about this? When somebody challenges who you think you are on a negative level, that's when we get upset. But if somebody overinflates what you are, you never go, you're not going to say that about me. I'm not a brilliant singer. I'm not a brilliant musician. Get your facts right, love. Do we? We're always ready to bite somebody when they don't lift us up to where we should be. But when they lie about us or whatever, we don't go, no, 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 let's just... Oh, I find humanity really interesting. Don't you? Anyway, it's inevitable that offences will come. So, our sense of self gets challenged and sometimes the final straw is what breaks the camel's back and we've talked about these things before. So what should we do when we're wronged? Can we just keep this really simple? What should we do when we're wronged? And I think we can make this incredible. See, I think that we, who are the ecclesia of God, the people who have been called to participate in the bringing in of, a, of the peaceable kingdom, if we don't know how to be different and deal things with, uh, with integrity and, and just be different, then... What's the point? What is the point? I'm equipping you to go out there in order to be different. And like Anne said before, people end up doing horrible things. And I, have we got little kids in now? Oh, don't we? You know, that, that young lad who was, who was murdered, uh, how horrendous. Why has that happened? Because somebody was wronged. That's it. As simple as that, somebody was wronged for crying out loud. So if we don't start where we are, figuring out how not to respond wrongly when we are wronged, then hopefully the light and the sound will billow from this place and people will, will get the bug. Do you think, hopefully? So, reputation. Oh, let me just say this. And the answer was brilliant last week. When he said humility is voluntary humiliation. I thought that was brilliant. So even in, in all of this, we've got to have a voluntary uh, willingness to humble ourselves, to do something different, a, a different response, a different attitude. Reputation is always at the root of pride and offence comes because we feel we are humiliated. Remember that people haven't seen us how we believe we are. And often when we think, oh yeah, but if I don't sort this out, people will think, da, 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 da. I find that hilarious because when you say, oh yeah, but you know, if we don't do this, people will think, I want to say immediately, who? What people? Because you know who you're talking about. You! The only person who's asking that question, people will think, is this people. Yeah? I will think. Oh, no, I will think. Because remember, we are the ones who bat our corners about who we think we are. Don't we beat the drum? So, does it matter? There's the question. Brennan Manning said something which I think is wonderful. He said, you can't offend a humble person. You can't. So if we learn a bit from last week and be humble, then we're already one step closer to, to a... Dealing with offence, aren't we? 
So, number one, what must we do in order to deal with this? Number one, let go of who you think you are, your reputation, and ask, does it matter? Of course it matters! Anth mentioned it in the pinch my scripture, but I've got it here. Philippians 2, 5, he said, God who, Jesus who thought it was not robbery to be equal God, with, with God. So he knew who he was. He absolutely had total confidence in his identity. But even though he knew who he was, he says, he made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a serpent and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Now, Ant went on to say, God has highly exalted him, and that's brilliant. But I want to just say, why is this so fantastic? Because he was going against everything in his whole being. He could have quite easily said, hey, I'm God. I'm God. Zap, or whatever. But he didn't even justify himself. Even the questions that were being asked, you know, are, are you who people say you are? Are this and that? He didn't try to to to, to defend or, or or promote himself. He just, in some places, says he was silent. Oh, that would be good for some of us at times, wouldn't it? Just to be silent. Ooh, learn a lesson there. So he didn't try to set the record straight. See, he was God. And he was willing to enter an arena that was totally alien to himself, which was death. And also, he humbly, it says, and humbled himself to death, even the death of the cross. See, the cross was the, the death place of criminals. So you can imagine, not only his reputation in his life he didn't uh, sort of fight for, but even in his death, talk about a double whammy. So in his life, the morning about who are you and you're doing this wrong and you're doing that wrong. And then in his death, they're saying, well, there you go. If you were God, you would raise yourself from the dead. And if you, were, uh, if you really were uh, who you say you are, you wouldn't have allowed yourself to be crucified because now you're a criminal and how can we worship a criminal? So he put himself in. I love this. I'll be honest, I love it because it gives me absolute an example to say, come on, Chris. Come on, Chris. Let's have a bit of Jesus. Have a bit of Jesus in me when, when stuff's going on. So, that's number one. What was number one? Do you remember? Let go of who you think you are, your reputation. Number two, forgive. Oh, that's obvious, isn't it? Really obvious. Let's forgive. And of course, the question comes, how many times should I forgive my brother? And Anth brought this a few weeks ago. The answer came back 70 times seven. You know, an incredible amount. And then when you get to... 490, then you, you, you keep forgiving as well. But I think what's amazing here is you've got to remember that we forgive as Christ forgives us. Most of the time we struggle with, with forgiveness because we're actually not very good at, at admitting that we need forgiveness ourselves. It just, I don't know where we lose our brain cell in the, in the process of life. Because when we've been wronged, we never stop for a minute and say, but I have wronged others. I have wanted them to forgive me. How dare I now be stubborn and not do the same? Why is it that we don't go through that little bit of a mind exercise before going, no, you know, circle of trust, Greg. We've done it before we've even thought. But if when somebody does it to us, our hearts break. So let's think, forgive as Christ has forgiven us, which puts it into a wonderful, oh, it, it, it's a big place, that. Because if we're forgiving it, as we forgive each other, it's going to be a bit messy and a bit here, here and there. But if we forgive as Christ forgave us, there's no excuse, is there? Whoa. So, forgive. So we've let go of reputation. We forgive. But we've got a problem with this, if you don't mind me saying, because forgiveness uh, doesn't always do the whole work. It's, it's, it's quite interesting, this, because often when we've been wronged, we can forgive, but we lose 
trust. And this is what Beth was saying. So the forgiveness might have been given, but we then put in place things that protect us from it. We think, well, I don't want that ever to happen again. So I put in place the things to, to protect us, but we never ever get back to where we were before. So isn't it weird that we can have this incredible word called forgiveness, but it doesn't restore anything. Come on, be honest. And Beth was lovely and honest about, you know, the, the fact that she's been through divorce. You know, you can forgive, but it doesn't restore. So you think, well, heck, why isn't that enough? Because it isn't. There's got to be something beyond the forgiveness. And you see, Jesus said, you know, it's easy to say, I love those who are nice and, you know, uh, 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 love your friends. But he says, anybody can do that. He says, really, the idea is you've got to go beyond into that arena where it almost kills you because you're actually saying, I will restore and put back to where it was before, even in the light of all this happened. That's massive, isn't it? So if you've been embezzled and somebody's pinched all your money and you know that it's Zacchaeus and then you forgive, you don't say, yeah, but you ain't going to be my accountant. You say, I forgive you and guess what? You're going to continue and be in my circle of trust. You're going to do my books. It's where the rubber hits the road. And we live in a world where we're now so risk uh, assessing and CRB in and uh, making sure we're covering all the bases, fire doors, and have we made sure this, that, and the other. And please don't misunderstand me. I get it. I understand. But listen to me. And, it, and I, I hope you hear from my heart and don't think I'm just being a silly idiot. It's absolutely opposite to kingdom living. Opposite. 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 And so we're doing it in this church. We, made, we have to. And we are gladly doing it, so please don't get me wrong. But it's opposite. When I have to keep a record of everybody's wrongs just to be sure we're safe, I am going against Everything that the kingdom stands for. See, record of wrongs keeps Greg outside the circle of trust. But you see, if there's no record of wrong, there's no problem, is there? Because there's nothing for me not to trust. Oh boy. We all need some Valium after that. Because can you hear it? It goes against, it goes against everything in our heads. So you see, we forgive, but from now on, we've got it in our head. We'll, we'll be wary. We'll keep at arm's length. And then we say things like, well, trust has got to be earned. Does it? Oh, I'm throwing some things out there for you. Because this is a tough business. But you see, if every time I go wrong... And God says to me, okay, chappy, you've got to earn my trust again. Is that what you really think God does? See, if he's a good dad, if he's a good dad, he might be sad at what has gone on. But does he withhold and withdraw and pull away or put you outside? Of course he doesn't. And yet we somehow want to live in this very alternative uh, situation. So forgiveness only takes us so far. The only way a relationship will be really healed is by this. We have to reinstate righteousness. And righteousness really is very simple. It puts the person who offended you right back to the place that they were before they did. And in your mind, it's been blotted. See, what did, what did uh, 
uh, well, God says in Psalms somewhere, he says, uh, yeah, well, he, even in the new covenant, he said, and your sins and unrighteous acts, I will remember no more. Well, that's not a safe thing to do, is it, for God? That's not very safe. Oh, no, I'll tell you what, we'll just keep them over here so we can be warned, so we can know. And so when really stuff happens, at least we've we can have a bit of a warning. No, he says, your sins and unrighteous acts, I will remember no more. So when we're talking about reinstating somebody to the place they were before the offence, we are talking about the whole thing has been erased from our memory and we remember it no more. That's quite powerful, isn't it? And I'm not there. I can I, Honestly, I'm not there at all. I'll tell you what, I'm trying, I, I really am trying, and, and again, I don't want to, to uh, come across as proud, but I am trying, I really am trying, I want to be different, and, and sometimes I know my, my own kids will, will moan at me because they'll say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, I love the buts, yeah, but, yeah, but, I'll say, yeah, but, come on, hey, you never say that, you say, can I ask a question, that's what Joel does. See, let me, t let me ex say this. Without reinstating righteousness, we will never restore the trust. Never restore, the trust will never come. And some of you want to restore trust in situations, but you still put in place boundaries to keep you safe, which means that that trust can never, ever be restored. You're shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, but you see, yeah, but I might get hurt again. Okay. And then you'll go around again. Oh, you're going to say, well, we can't do that. But anyway, let, let's move on. So, we struggle to trust that which has a record. So if we don't keep a record, then there's nothing not to trust. Is this making sense? So Jesus' death didn't only forgive us, but it reinstated our righteousness. Our right standing in the circle of trust with the Godhead Jesus holds nothing against me. I have no record. For forgiveness of sin is great, but the full gospel goes further than that. It's the gospel of reinstated righteousness. Now, one of my favorite scriptures is this. Romans 1.18, it, it says this. For in the gospel, a righteousness is revealed. A righteousness is revealed. Not forgiveness is revealed. It's a righteousness. So, it's the, it's the whole package that says, I'll tell you what, we'll, when I do this work, I'm not just going to forgive, but I'm going to reinstate you right back to the position that you held before any of this kicked off. Do you think that's great? I do. I think it's awesome. So I become justified. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore being justified by faith. Now listen to this. It's wonderful. I have peace. Why is it that when we're in situations of offence, we lose our peace? Because we want justification, right? Think about it. We want justification, but we don't want it to come by faith. We want it to come by being made right. Ooh. How about saying, I'll tell you what, I will have my justification, but I will be just if I'd never... Do you get me? Because that's what the word says. It's justified never. Instead of justified by our need to be right, we will be justified by faith in a process that will always restore. Now, that's big stuff, isn't it? So, not remembering brings closure. How fantastic. Now, some of you say, I just can't. I can't do this. This is, this is too hard. Now, you see, something that Anth did on, on Wednesday night, which was lovely, we had this picture, and for those who were, were there, we'll get this. Down one side, we have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he put that it led to death. And then on the other side, it was the tree of life, and it led to life. But you see, I was, th I was just thinking about all of this. There's a paradox here, because although we're told eating at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil leads to death, and it does... It's actually an ego feeder because the more that you want to uh, 
protect yourself and protect who you are by living out what's right and wrong. You'll keep feeding that ego. Yes, you'll feel better for a while and you'll feel as though I'm alive. There, that sort that out. But guess what's happening? You're living for a little while to die. But if you're eating at the tree of life, this is where it gets a little bit difficult. Although you're working out the principles of the tree of, of life, you actually find that you're experiencing a kind of death all the time because you're having to die to yourself, but you're dying to yourself in order to live. It's fantastic. Fantastic. It, it is, it's fantastic. When are we going to get it into our heads that the whole gospel of righteousness goes against the grain of our humanity and that's why we struggle so much so where do you stand listen to this hebrews 5 13 says this anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness now what does that teaching about righteousness yeah, you know about forgiveness, you know about all of this, that and the other, but you haven't gone the next step to understand that righteousness has to be restored in order that we might go further than just being kiddy in all this. It's about growing up. Let's grow up. Get acquainted with the teaching of righteousness. Get rid of the record. Let's sins and righteous, uh, unrighteous acts be remembered no more and let's restore the trust so the person can be put back in the circle of trust do you get it okay a few two minutes and then i'm nearly done matthew 5 38 jesus uh, tells us why it's good to live this way and a few months ago when uh, i was going to speak and i had i lost my voice i was going to preach on this passage and i'm not going to do it now but Basically, Jesus gives us some instructions and he says this, listen, and, and like I said at the beginning, if we are going to be people of the way, people who truly want to live out this revolutionary lifestyle of Jesus, these are just a few things that are very clear that he says do. Uh, listen to this, turn the other cheek. Try. <laughs> so when I come to you after him, Go to hit you. You know what you're going to do, don't you? Right. Go the second mile. Now, there's little background stories to these, but I'm just giving you them and letting you think. Go the second mile. Give people the shirt of, off your back. If that's what they want, you think, well, that's going too far. There's a story behind that too, but I'm this is what Jesus said. Give them the shirt off your back. Forgo your rights. Forgo them. Let them go and kill your enemies with kindness. They're just basic things. He says, do these if you want to live this revolutionary lifestyle. Why? And this is the reason. In Matthew 5, verse 45, there's a great verse. He says, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. And then this is weird that this should, well, it's weird for me that this should follow. Because he says, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and says, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. I'm thinking, what's that doing there? Because he's talking about so that you might be sons of your father and then he starts, starts talking about the weather. It just doesn't seem to, like, hello? But it actually, it's very, very powerful and let me tell you why. See, it's not saying so that you might be sons of your father like, oh, if you do these things, those five things, that means you're in the kingdom. He's not meaning like you'll become a son of God and therefore you're in. It's not, he's not saying that because it's actually a bit like this. It's the idiom. You know, it says, like father, like son. You know, and somebody says, oh, like father, like son. Because they're actually saying, oh, you do exactly just like your dad used to do. Now, come on, kids. How many times do your parents or grandparents say, oh, do you know, your Uncle Fred used to do that. You know, like father, like son. You know what I mean? And actually what this is saying is if you do these things, listen, turn the other cheek, go the second mile, give the shirt off your back, forgo your rights, kill your enemies with kindness. He says, you will be like your father in heaven. He's not asking you to do anything that he won't do. Whoa. Oh, I'm glad I've got a dad like that. Oh, I'm glad this is my dad. It's my dad. 
And then the bit about the weather, I love this. Because even God does not withhold from anyone, even the rain, even the sun. He doesn't say, okay, outside the circle of trust, Chris, you ain't going to have any sunshine or any rain now until you sort yourself out. Because he says, no, I'm still going to give you good stuff. Now, how often do we withhold when somebody's upset us? For it says here, even God does not withhold from it anyone. Okay, so just wrap this up very, very quickly. If this is to come about, we've got to grow up. We've got to get acquainted with the teaching of reinstated righteousness. You have been put back exactly where you were before it all went wrong. Is that simple enough to say? You're back in the circle with the Godhead. You were made to dwell in it, to dwell with it all. And what we have to do in all that goes on in our lives with all these things that challenge our identity, that challenge who we think we are, and most of us have got such an inflated ego, it's scary. We've got to reverse it all and say, I tell you what, I'm not going to live by the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, right and wrong, but I'm going to be willing to be humble myself even unto dying daily in order that I might be resurrected. Yeah, see? Also, otherwise, you can have your pound of flesh and be right, but I'll tell you where he's heading. He's going to kill you. He's going to kill you every time. So which are we going to choose? So opposite actions, attitude, responses, let go of your reputation, die to live, forgive, but be sure to reinstate righteousness. Trust will automatically come back because your sins and unrighteous acts will be remembered no more, not only by your Father in heaven, but by each of us with each other. Oh, I think that sounds a bit like heaven on earth. Sounds good. So who's up for having a go? Now, that doesn't mean to say we can't say things to each other. But you see, if we're coming under, and that's where I liked about following this after what Anne said. If we're coming under the pouring to receive, it's not going to be a problem, is it? Because we're going to receive it. We're going to listen. We're going to take it on board. And do you know what I've always understood? And it's helped me a lot. When somebody comes to tell me that they think I have... Uh, done something wrong or I'm this or that or the other I have learned to do this and, I, and you'll say I'm right you'll, you'll reinforce it I'll say thank you I'm going to go away and think about that now you might think well, that's ridiculous no it's good it's the best thing anybody can say to you they come and say do you know I've noticed this that and the other instead of going you what you're wrong you think do you know what thank you my daughter said to me, and I'm sorry I'm going on now, but I've just got to say this. My daughter got me the other day, and she said to me, you like, you like it when I tell you the truth about my life, don't you? I'm sure you do. She said, you do know, Mum, you're an enabler. <sighs> do you remember what we said when somebody challenges you about what you believe you are? I'm not an enabler. And then I had to think, do you know what? I might be. Yeah, do you know what? I might be. Now, nobody wants to be told something that is potentially dangerous or silly that you're doing in your life. But you know what? As I was willing to come under the, the jug of Connie telling me, I had to say, do you know, I'm going to go away and think, didn't I? I said, I'm going to go away and think about that. Because I want to learn. I want to live kingdom and I want the peaceable kingdom of God to be here. And I don't want to get in the way of it. Do you want to get in the way of it? No, of course not. So let it come. Let it come in. And you know, like it says, if you do this, you will be like your father in heaven. Now, don't get me wrong. This isn't about let's do these things so we can have brownie points. Because the truth is, you can't earn anything. But what you can do is participate in the building of a peaceable kingdom.
And we want to see it come, don't we? Yeah? So that's it. I'm done. I hope it's helped. Let's keep, keep going, yeah? All right, thank you very much. Do you want to say anything? All right, okay. We're done then. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. Then why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.